Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Toho. So today we're going to be talking about the ABC killer. The ABC killer has the highest body count of any other convicted killer in South Africa. He killed about 38 women between July 1994 to November 1995. He was also known as the South African Strangler and the Gauteng Strangler, but the ABC killer became a more well-known name because he killed women between Ottridgefield, Boxburg and Cleveland in Johannesburg. So for those of you who don't know, a serial killer is a person who commits a series of murders, usually with no apparent motive, and they usually follow a certain characteristic or behavior pattern. On the 17th of September 1995, a police officer who was off duty decided to go to a nearby felt near the prison in Boxburg. As he was walking through the felt, he smelled a really foul odour, which he associated with decomposition. As he was looking further, he found the first body of a woman. As he looked further around in the felt, he found nine more bodies, all who were in varying degrees of decomposition. So some were from a year earlier and some had only been there for a couple of weeks. And automatically the police assumed that this was the ABC killer. This was because the ABC killer usually targeted a certain group of people, which was black women between the ages of 19 and 43. He usually strangled them with any item of clothing that he could find, which was usually a bra, their underwear or stockings that he found around. He would also torture them and by that I mean he would like take a stick and as he wrapped that item of clothing around their neck, he would wrap the stick around it and kind of twist it around their neck as well. Like, you know, I hope I'm making sense. So police officers just assumed it was him. The first body was found on the 16th of July, 1994. It was the body of a woman who was found with her son. Police officers say once the first body was found, it's as though they just wouldn't stop. So they would find a new body every second week, sometimes two bodies once a week, and a body every other week in any fault between Altridgeville, Boxburg, and Cleveland in Johannesburg. And police officers were kind of at their wit's end because they had DNA evidence, but they had, they literally had no suspects. This was until the disappearance of Trifina Mkhozi. So police officers decided to look into the disappearance of Mkhozi and the first step was to ask friends and family about the last time they had seen her and if she had said anything to them. So police officers found one friend who had seen her the day before she disappeared. And this friend said as they were working, a man came in and offered her a job. And for this to sound really familiar to police officers because from other interviews they had done with family members and friends from the other victims, they said a similar thing, that a man had offered the woman a job and then that was the last time they ever saw them. So the police officers decided to ask the friend if the man had given her a name or given them a name rather. And she said that he gave them the name Moses Satole. So police officers took this name and decided to search it in the system. However, Moses Satole is like a very common name, so a lot of people have it. So it was a bit challenging. However, police officers found one Moses Satole that had previously been convicted for rape. So with this name, they printed his picture and took it back to the friend who identified him as the man that had come in earlier and offered Trifina the job. So with the friend having positively identified Moses Sitole, police officers finally had their first suspect in over a year. So with that, let me just tell you a little more about this man. Moses was the fourth child of Sophie and Simon Sitole. He was born on the 17th of November, 1964 in Fosluris. Moses claims that when he was younger, he was abused by his mother as well as his stepsister. He also says that his mother was an alcoholic. He also claims that when he was younger, he was raped by a woman. When Moses was six years old, his father passed away. And because the father was the breadwinner of the family, they were unfortunately evicted from their house. After that, his mother decided to put him in an orphanage and 
from then onwards he was just bounced around from one youth home to another and he says that he was just treated badly throughout all those years when he was eight years old he escaped from one of the youth homes and went back home and once he got back home he assumed that he'd have a great reunion with his mother and it didn't turn out anything like that she kind of got angry like questioning why he came back and took him back to the orphanage that he had escaped from when he was 11 he moved to KwaZulu Natal to another youth home in his early teenage years he ran away from that home and he ran away back to Fort Lewis and decided to move in with his older brother Patrick. People say he was really popular with women and well-spoken however he was quick to anger when rejected by the other gender. In 1987 Moses was 22 years old and he attacked his first victim who was his girlfriend's sister. Her name was Precious Kumalo and she was 38 years old at the time so he took her to a fault and raped her and threatened to kill her if she did report it to the police and after that she just kind of kept quiet and never said anything about it so the third victim that he raped was Lindiwe Kumalo who also happened to be one of his girlfriend's sisters so he took her to a fault threatened to pour gasoline on her and burn her alive. He then proceeded to rape her and choke her till she lost unconsciousness. Once she regained consciousness, he threatened to kill her if she reported him to the police. And after that, they just both went home and she never reported the incident. In 1989, Moses met a woman and her name was Dora. He said that he was a wealthy businessman and offered her a job and said that he could take her to that job. So they climbed on a taxi and got off by a nearby fault. As we were walking in the fault, he took out a knife and threatened to kill her. He then proceeded to assault her and he had tied her arms around her back with her underwear. After he was done assaulting her, he said that if she ever went to the police, he would kill her. Three months later, when she was in a shop, she saw Moses and immediately decided to call the police. So the police came and arrested Moses. And they also took Dora with them and put them both in the back of a police van. I don't understand why they would put a victim with a perpetrator in the back of a van. It doesn't make sense. But that's what they did. And the police officer that was driving heard Moses whisper to Dora, Bitch, I should have killed you. Moses claimed that he was innocent, however, the judge didn't believe him, and he was then sentenced to seven years for rape. While he was in prison, Moses claims that he was sodomized and isolated from all the other inmates just because they didn't want to be around him because he was a rapist. Moses was released in 1994. I couldn't find the exact reason why, but he was supposed to be released in 1996. So once he was released, he moved in with a woman and her name was Martha Ndrovu, who also happened to be an inmate's sister. So they started their relationship while her brother was in prison and she would go visit him. And you know, somehow they met and things just happened. So once he was released, he moved in with her and her family didn't approve. They didn't understand why she would want to be with a convicted rapist. And, you know, it's understandable why they wouldn't accept it. But she was like, look, I love him. And, you know, they continued and they then got traditionally married. After that, Moses decided to work for Martha's father alongside his brother-in-law and they would just fix cars up. And, you know, after some time, he just decided he just decided that that wasn't for him. So one day he just said, look, I'm going to go out and look for a job. So every day he would dress up in a nice suit and have a newspaper under his arm and go out claiming to look for a job when in actuality he would go looking for his first victim and many more. Around this time Nelson Mandela had just become president so black people were allowed to move around more freely and it's kind of like today when people are like oh I'm going to Gauteng, I'm going to Joburg, I'm going to go look for a job like there's more job opportunities there and that's the case here many people not just women just people in general would go to Gauteng and look for jobs and he kind of used this to get to them so around this time he met a woman her name was Maria Monama in the streets of Pretoria he introduced himself as Sylvester not only to her but to her family as well 
and you know they liked him they were intrigued as i mentioned before he was well spoken and they really didn't see a problem with it and you know they were excited that she's gonna go out and find a job on the 16th of july 1994 police officers found the body of maria monama she was moses atole's first victim they found her in a fault and she had been strangled by an article of clothing police officers noticed that on her thigh there was a there was a message engraved and it said i am not fighting with you you will stay here until you understand so that is the end of part one um i can tell that this is going to be a relatively long video so i've decided to turn it into two parts i hope you enjoyed part one please leave any comments below um about the case and i'll see you guys next week bye